Hello, it's Jeremy Faust, Medical Editor-in-Chief of MedPage Today. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are going to be speaking with Dr. Peter Hotez, the Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine and Professor of Pediatrics and Molecular Virology at Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Peter Hotez, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see you, Jeremy. It's uh, fantastic. Um, let's talk about the the White House uh, Next Generation Vaccine Summit, which you just were uh, you just attended and just got back from. What did what did you learn there? Well, I think it was really to kind of begin the long process of making a game plan for the nation and globally what we do about uh, vaccines. Um, it's we and I think there there are bit there are long term con- issues and I think there are short term things we need to think about. I think in the long term. There's a lot of enthusiasm for building next generation universal coronavirus vaccines, and their number of groups are now have proposed interesting concepts for that, including our group. We're also, in addition to our COVID vaccine, that's now been um, about 66 million doses have been given in in India. Um, We're also interested in in universal coronavirus vaccines, as well as the potential benefits of uh, alternative delivery platforms like intranasal vaccines or, or or vaccines delivered on a skin patch. So that's the big picture. Then the question is how, whether there will be the adequate funds to actually support that either through NIH or BARDA and other mechanisms. And then if so, what kind of time frame are we talking about? Um, so I offered that I don't, I can't imagine those vaccines would be ready anytime before 2024. Others said that was optimistic. We're probably looking at three to five years. Hmm. And then my my good friend, Eric Topol, was more optimistic. He thought, you know, the fact that now the, at least for the intranasal vaccine, some of them are in phase two or three trials that we can move even faster. So some differences in perspective on how quickly that can mobilize. But, but I, I said, look, no matter what, you're still going to need an interim strategy. And that's also missing um, because... Um, the only thing really being discussed right now is a bivalent booster, an mRNA yeah. booster that, that when RNA is to the original lineage and the other is to the BA5. I I was not, I'm not very enthusiastic about that kind of bivalent booster because I think by the time it's available in the fall, BA5 may be behind us and um, we could be dealing with something else. So I've said, you know, I think we need another type of alternative uh, um, a booster strategy, one preferably that would, that where we could boost and then we would have a year or two of protection because that's ordinarily what we've come to expect from boosters before COVID, right? You, you know, you vaccinate your kids, series of primary immunizations, you wait six months to a year and then you get protection for five, 10 years. And that, that's what we should be expecting. But it's not happening with the mRNA technology, whether it's purely because of the technology or whether it's because of all of the antigenic variation from these COVID subvariants. I don't think we know, but I think we need to put a program in place where we look at alternative boosters um, and even including our vaccine um, uh, as well. So those were the kind of the big picture discussions. I think the thing that I'm interested in the most right now is the, is that sort of pipeline for this new technology or these new technologies. And I, I, I myself am impatient and I sense that everyone is as well. They say, look, we had Operation Warp Speed. No one had ever seen an, an mRNA vaccine go to market or, or be available. And then, you know, within the calendar year, we did it. Um, and they're they're working great for their stated purpose. Why the longer time frame now for these other technologies, which it, as far as I'm concerned, like we we have done uh, mucosal vaccines before. Like that's not new. So why the longer uh, kind of runway? Remember, making a COVID vaccine in terms of low hanging fruit or difficult vaccines, a, a coronavirus vaccine is relatively straightforward, right? You get enough virus neutralizing antibody to the spike protein or its receptor binding domain. You get memory B cells and T cell responses. You'll have a vaccine. And that's why there are multiple ways to skin the cat. That's why our vaccine works, why mRNA vaccines work, why adenovirus vectored vaccines work. Um, The issue around the universal and the mucosal are two separate issues. So with universal, you know, try since you can never anticipate all of the different coronaviruses that are out there, you have to find a way to get 
broadly neutral antibodies that are broadly neutralizing. And that, you know, we've learned from HIV AIDS, that's easier um, said than done. Um, we have a strategy where, for instance, we've made the SARS-1 and SARS-2 equivalent of our COVID vaccine, as well as some others. So by combining them in a polyvalent strategy, um, we think that's one way to go. Others, like the group at Caltech, has been working on uh, trying to put multiple epitopes on a single particle. And that's a it's a really cool idea. The question is, can you do it at scale up and can you do it under a quality control to control the stoichiometry of how many molecules of each go on? So there are some, some technical complexities there. With mucosal delivery, I mean, quite honestly, you know, there's some you know, the in skin patch, those ideas have been around for decades. I mean, when I was getting my MD PhD a hundred years ago, we were talking about that. But the actual number of licensed vaccines that have gone through the gauntlet that actually do mucosal delivery. I mean, there's there's flu mist, there's there's not many many things out there. So uh, a lot of good ideas, a lot of cool concepts, but not nearly as much successful product development. So that's that's the reason for the more cautious timeline. Anyone under 50, I think, does maximize their their sort of benefit after two, maybe three doses. Um, and anyone over 50, the way I see it is you have to stay up to date because right. basically you could you might not get hospitalized for COVID pneumonia, but you might get hospitalized for something else, which COVID was, you know, basically the the, the only asterisk I would put on that statement is, you know, when you look at you know, a lot of times we have the data first on those over the age of 50, and that becomes the tip of the spear. And then only later on do we learn about what's happening under 50. So, yeah. I'm, so I'm still supportive of universalizing. Anyone who wants to get a second booster sh should, should go ahead, given the fact that we're throwing away a lot of vaccine mm -hmm. anyway, better to, better to use it rather than lose it. Okay. Well, rather than like do a journal club on that. Um, what I what I would say is what I would ask, given that is you know your opinion. Um, do you think that someone who is who's hearing that message, who's you know 20, 30, 40 years old, should get a second booster now? Here it is, late July, or should they wait for the bivalent, which is probably going to be available in eight weeks, and they certainly wouldn't want to miss out on this better protection if, if that's how you read the literature. I don't still don't think it's a slam dunk that those new vaccines are going to come out. I mean, because what happens if by let's say it's, you know, eight weeks is a pretty optimistic time frame. Let's say it's October, November, and BA5 is long gone. Is is the ACIP and CDC going to still recommend it? Um, I, I don't know. So I think there's too much of an unknown. And now BA5 is accelerating. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna do something as an intervention, I think now's the time to do it because I think BA5 may be way past us ba okay. based on other linear, based on the history of other variants. Right. And the question, which we can't know the answer to is what's going to replace it, something similar, something completely different. So there's always, there's, there's a bit of a gamble to, to any approach at this point. You can't, right. you can't, you can't know. And, and that's why I think we need a longer term strategy um, that looks past mRNA to see if there are other technologies that we could boost with now that will give us more durable protection while we're waiting for the for the universals and the mucosal deliveries and everything else. Right. So this is the this is the promise of the sort of pan vaccine, right, right. multivalent vaccine. Right. You right now we're looking at boosters, the bivalent, but I mean I don't think anyone's looking at the question of um, a bivalent primary series or a polyvalent primary series. And if they are, I, I certainly don't think we're going to have a, a change at the at the policy level anytime soon. Do you? Well, I mean, that's what that could be wound up being what the universal coronavirus vaccine is. Um, and then how would that work on a background of people who have been getting immunized, who got immunized with the original COVID lineage, I think is an unknown. Dr. Peter Hotez, um, by the way, your book, Preventing the Next Pandemic, Vaccine Diplomacy in the Time of Anti-Science. I am midway through it. It's a very interesting book about your life uh, as, as a scientific envoy and a longtime uh, vaccine advocate, um, not, not, not late to this fire. Early on, you've been on this. Uh, I recommend it to everybody. And uh, thank you so much for joining us.